this is Pastor Appreciation Day. A number of you heard me say in the past, there was a Father's Day when I was on the road traveling. And I was down toward New York City and I was out with my family. And I called home that day and I called all my daughters and I said to them, Happy Father's Day. And they said, why are you wishing us a happy Father's Day? I said, because I wouldn't be a father without you. And this is Pastor Appreciation Day, but Jennifer and I say happy Pastor Appreciation Day because we wouldn't be pastoring without you. This is your day. And we thank you for the opportunity and the privilege that we have of, of being part of the team at Central Assembly of God. I have a word today, and every week I say, Lord, I want a word from you. I don't want to preach a sermon, but today is one of those, you don't want to miss Sunday service. I have a prophetic word for the body and a personal word for individuals. I want you to hear, not the word of a man, but I want you to hear the voice of God today. What I'm going to share is very vital to the life of Central Assembly of God. And uh, I want you to turn to the book of Haggai, chapter 2. Hallelujah. Again, thank you for allowing Jennifer and I the privilege of pastoring. And for Pastor David and Jessica, I'll speak for them as well. The privilege we have of ministering, and we trust that we are that minister, servants. We believe in servant leadership. We don't believe in lording it over the flock. We want to be an example. Our desire is that Paul declared, follow me as I follow Christ. And we desire to live in a way and to lead in a way that you will see clearly which way to walk and which way not to walk. And I've said before, you'll probably learn by watching my life where not to walk more than where to walk. But learn how to get where you need to go and let God be your guide. Amen? Praise God. I'm sharing this morning on the subject, the tale of three temples. The tale of three temples. The verse number one of Zechariah chapter two through verse nine. In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? How do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, O ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. For I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you. Fear not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of a far, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place do I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Father, this morning I pray you do what man can never accomplish. I pray you would speak so clear and concise that we will not miss the meaning of the message delivered. I pray, Father, that, Lord, you would guard my heart and my head, my words and my walk. I pray, Father, that, Lord, nothing shared today would come out of arrogance, ego, or attitude. But I pray it would flow from humility of heart. And I pray it would come, Lord, only as 
since I have tarried and waited on you and listened for your leading. And I pray, God, that you would speak specifically, not just the words that come from the lip of the preacher, but, Lord, the word of God from the Holy Ghost into the ear and the heart of the hearer. Lord, I pray that somebody would hear from heaven today. And God, I pray, Lord, it would be a word, Father, that would transform their attitude, their life, and Lord, their complete walk with you. Father, I pray you do what only you can do. And Lord, I give you all the glory and all the honor in Jesus' name. among you that saw this house in her first glory. And how do you see it now? Many of you were here when this church was flourishing and not flowering. Many of you were here when this church was operating at its peak. And now as you look around and now as your eyes behold the situation and the circumstance, you think, boy, it's sure not like the good old days. It's not the way it used to be. And may I say to you, it should not be the way it used to be. It needs to be the way it ought to be. Amen? We are not looking to replicate or reproduce what has been. We are looking to rebuild as God directs. We are not going to be here to try to copy. And we are not going to plagiarize another's work. We're here to do the work that God has commissioned us to do. It's a new day, a new dawn, a new beginning, and it needs to be a right start and a right beginning. Amen? Amen? God has given us a job to do, but what an incredible undertaking it was. David had a desire to build a house for the Lord, but because he had been a man of war, God did not allow him to build it. That privilege and responsibility was handed over to his son Solomon. And although David was not the man to build it, he made preparation for it. You see, it was not about David's ego, it was about God's glory. Solomon took the reins of responsibility and as he did, he spared no expense. He employed 150,000 workers with 3,850 supervisors in the construction of that first temple that was built. You see, he used the cedars from Lebanon and fir wood from far country. He had gold and silver overlaying the wood. He had the finest of fabric and when he began to hew out the stones, the stones that were used were prepared at the quarry so there would be no sound of hammer, chisel, or any iron tool heard at the building site. You see, this was a sacred territory. This was a peaceful place. The Finnish temple was outwardly opulent and externally exquisite. If we were to put a price tag on Solomon's temple in our modern day and age, it would cost approximately $140 billion to build it and to construct that edifice. I thank God for previous pastors who have made incredible investments into this church. They have made incredible investments into the kingdom. But Solomon's temple could not be compared to by any other building or edifice. Nothing would rival Solomon's temple. Now, again, I am preaching prophetically to the body, but I am also preaching to you as an individual. Hear what I'm saying and understand it to be corporate as well as specific to you. Success always gets attention. Well, it's quiet today. You don't have to be nervous. You don't have to be worried. You don't have to be anxious. But 
Success always gets attention. Don't we all feel a sense of satisfaction when we succeed at something? It may not be an Academy Award or an Olympic gold medal. It may be a college degree or a job promotion or paying off a vehicle or a house or getting victory over an addiction. It, it may seem small to others, but it is a big deal to you. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse number 12, it says, Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. And we dwell on that part, but the second part says, But when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. Amen? When you finally get what you've been searching for, when you finally reach what you've been aiming at, when you finally achieve what you have been working toward, it is a sense of satisfaction that is unequal. And in our lives, every one of us has something that we can look at and say, how oh, I accomplished something that I, I'm glad I did. It draws you in. In verse 19 of Proverbs 13, it says, The desire accomplished is sweet to the soul. It's an abomination of fools to depart from evil, but the desire accomplished is sweet to the soul. Just think of some of the landmarks in your life today. What are some of the things that you can look upon? And as I, as I begin to open my word and God directed me to this passage, he began to speak prophetically, then he began to deal with me specifically. He began to speak to me about my life. And you know, you can look at past years and you can look at future hope and you can look and compare and look and... And sometimes the glory days seem like they're gone and there'll be no more of what was. You may think that to be true not only in this church and you may not think that only to be true in your life. You may say, I've done things in the past that I'll never equal again in my own life. The best is behind me. But I've got a word for you today that's a lie from the pit of hell. Amen? You're going to hear it again and again throughout this message. The best is yet to come. Amen. The best is still ahead of you. If you are down and discouraged and doubtful and depressed, I want to tell you it's time to turn that frown upside down and get ready for God to do something of significance. You see, Solomon's temple stood for over 400 years, about 410 years, some commentators say, and and it was finally destroyed in 587 B.C. by the Babylonians. And its, its destruction was devastating to Israel. Just like 911 and the destruction and the collapse of the Twin Towers affected America, it demoralized us. The Twin Towers represented our economic status. There were a lot of financial offices in those buildings and it was a sign of our affluence and our success. The temple was not an economic success. It was a spiritual success. That was the center of worship. And, and in those days, worship mattered more than money. Today, we worship our money. And just as the Twin Towers being knocked down demoralized America, we were vulnerable. We could be hit. We could be hurt. We could be attacked and we couldn't stop it. And what was so demoralizing about it was it was 19 men armed with box cutters that got the job done. It wasn't high tech. It wasn't missiles from North Korea. It wasn't uh, any kind of military expertise. 19 men armed with box cutters demoralized America when the Twin Towers collapsed. I don't think America has been the same since. And I know that some feel it is controversial to mention our president. But I do agree with his philosophy, make America great again. Because I believe that since 9-1-1, America has stopped feeling great. They have stopped being the nation they used to be.
And sometimes when things begin to go downhill, even in the church, we're demoralized. We're devastated. And we lose heart. And we think, why God? We're vulnerable. We're weak. We're not what we used to be. And in our own personal lives, we say, well, I remember when. How many remember when you were a young person? I remember when I had hair. <laughs> Tell my wife I used to look better. The truth is, I used to see better. I don't know if I looked better, but I saw better. <laughs> Amen. The older I get, the more my sight goes away. I mean, so it's not a matter of a look, it's the sight. Amen. Can I tell you a little secret? In your life, it's not how you look, it's how you see. Amen. Ooh, that's a freebie. One well, part of the notes, but I think that's pretty good. Amen. Amen. Don't remember how you used to look. Remember what you used to see. And see what happened is we used to see vision. We used to have vision. The young men will see visions. Now we get older, we dream dreams, and some of us are sleeping through the dream. Boy, I remember when. I remember when it all began to come to fruition. I remember when it all came to pass. I remember when I was at the top of my game. I remember, and, and you know, i, I got to be honest, I have less time ahead of me than I have behind me. Grandchildren make you realize that. I saw three of my granddaughters yesterday, and my little one-year-old wore me out in a half an hour. I couldn't keep up with her. She has, she has more energy than all of her cousins, and she's the youngest of the bunch. And she has wanted to go here and go there. She grabbed her shoes and wanted me to take her outdoors and try to grab my shoes and bring them over to me so I'd have to take her out and go push her on the swing or run around the yard. And I found out that, you know, that I have less years ahead than I have behind. But that doesn't have to mean quantity trumps quality. Can I tell you, they call the older years the golden years for a reason. So you are saying, why? My hair falls out, my tooth, teeth let loose. Why are these, I heard one, one elderly retired individual a few years back say, I don't know why they call these the golden years. Because they sure don't feel golden. But I want to tell you, they can be. I've been, in my own life, just examining things and you get into the, the the understanding that you reach a new phase it's not a better phase or a worse phase it's just a different phase of life and what you're open to is new experience fresh experience you're now becoming the grandfather not the father when you used to be the son and not the father and now you've already transitioned through fatherhood so fast you don't even know where that went because now those years are gone and now you're, you have a new role to play. I like this role. I get to spoil them. I don't have to raise them. I still influence them but I like this role. I told my daughter, she said, well, we don't want to miss Grant's visit when you're coming. And I told her, and I said, I don't want to miss my granddaughters. Then I had an afterthought, so I texted back, or my daughter. She said, yeah, right, we're second fiddle now. <laughs> Thank you, you learned the lesson, girl. That's why I had you, so you could have my grandchildren. <laughs> but as the as Solomon's temple was destroyed and demolished, the destruction was devastating to Israel. It actually sucked the life out of them. They lost the motivation to move forward. How do you understand that disappointment always has a way of delaying progress? Disappointment always has a way of delaying process. Why? came to candidate for Central Assembly, the morale was very low. People were just leaving, even those that were here were leaving, they were going to other churches, it was like they were losing heart, services were being canceled and considered canceling others, and, and, and uh, some of the ministries had already collapsed and shut down, it was a time of moral decay and the morale, I should say, not moral, but morale decay. Put an 
be on that moral. Amen. But you see, what happens when you're disappointed is it distorts our vision and our perspective. We begin to see the glass half empty instead of seeing it as half full. We begin to see the problems instead of the potential. We begin to see what's missing instead of what we have. And I want to say this earlier, I'll say now, this church is full of quality people. Whether you realize it or not, I'm not saying we're the biggest show in town. We're not the biggest show in town, but I'm going to tell you right now, I, it's hard for us to find a church that has better quality people than Central Assembly of God has. We have, give, that's right, give yourself a hand and give it all glory. Amen? We have quality, talented people. We have people that have stuck with it through thick and thin. And I want you to know I am privileged to be in Central Assembly of God. Don't be discouraged, church. It's time to turn that frown into a smile. Amen. If we could only recognize the potential we have, we'd start the rebuilding process all over again. It's time to get our hearts back for where your treasure is. There will your heart be also. When you start to get excited again,
But when you get past that and get your purpose again and see your potential, you become proactive, not reactive. And that's where the church is getting to now. After three and a half years since I've been here, we're starting to get a little more proactive where we had to be in a place where we were mending wounds. We were reactive and we were trying to just bind up the broken. Now it's time where healing is happening. People are getting right. Now it's time to get motivated to get on with what God has called us to do from the get-go. Amen. Amen. Amen? Hallelujah. Good days are ahead. Good days are coming. Not that they're not here, but it's about to get gooder and gooder and gooder and gooder. And that may not be proper grammar, but that's good preaching. Gooder and gooder and gooder and gooder. Hallelujah. Because it's going to be God They started the rebuilding process in 538 B.C. And after two years, the building stopped. They received opposition from the Syrian people. And that opposition always arises when you begin recovery. The devil doesn't want you to succeed in getting back where you were. The devil will always try to discourage you and frustrate you more when he's got you now. Now, how many know the best time to hit your opponent is when you got him down? Yeah. Satan thinks he's going to finish us because he dazed us for a short time. But I got news for him. He doesn't have the knockout power. Amen? He doesn't have it. He just is not going to get the job done because we got a corner, man. God's in our corner. Amen? He knows how to get us ready for the next round. Amen? And when you come out into the next round, you're going to come out with fire and fury. You're not going to come out fatigued and falling apart. Amen? We're not going to come out at the opponent and the opposition weary and worn out. We're coming out energized, excited, equipped, and ready to move forward and take the devil out. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I don't know, I can't preach this the way I feel it out, but I'm telling you right now, church, God just spoke this. You know, I, I gave a word years ago that God would use this place as a center of revival. And when you come in and you start to see the, the opportunity kind of fade, you see the perspective kind of change, and now you're at the bottom instead of the top, and then you say, wait a minute, we're going to get back up there again. Hallelujah. Yeah. We're going up forward. We're going higher. Hallelujah. I want to tell you, we're in that stage and we're getting there. You see, God has a way of stirring our spirits. The Bible said in chapter 1, verse 14, the Lord stirred up their spirit. You see, after two years of, of building the foundation, after the foundation was laid, they had a celebration. Amen? One chorus would sing, praise the Lord, and the other would yell, his mercy endures forever. They would go back and forth, praise you, Lord. We were doing it this morning, amen. And Brendan and Jennifer were kind of going back and forth. That's what was happening at the dedication of the foundation of the second temple. But all of a sudden, when the people who remembered the glory of the first temple, remembered Solomon's temple, saw the foundation of the second temple, they said, this doesn't even compare to what it used to be. And they lost their shout. Where's this going? This is not going to ever equal what we've experienced before. So God has to come along and he says through Haggai, how many of you were here remember the glory of the first? And to you it looks like it's nothing in the second. But verse 4 he said, yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Joseph, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the Lord, and work, for I am with you. You see, although the work had stopped for 17 years, they began to work, work for a couple of years, got discouraged again, and they quit working for 17 years. Finally, they resumed rebuilding and they completed the project four years later in 515 B.C. The second temple was finished. The second temple was put up. There were three admonitions.
temptations in verse number four that God used to get them back on track. These are the three admonitions we need to hear this morning. Number one, he said, be strong. That word strong actually in the Hebrew word, wording means be constant or be courageous. It means to rise above your weakness. In other words, don't quit. Be strong enough to endure. Amen? It was more about their attitude than it was about the physical strength. Amen. It wasn't about how much weight they could lift. It was how much pain they could endure and how much they could handle. Amen. Be strong. Church, we need to get a right attitude. The Bible said in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, be strong. How? In the Lord and in the power of his might. Amen. Hallelujah. Isaiah 40, 31 said, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and they won't faint. Hallelujah. Church, we need to be strong in the Lord. Three times Moses told Joshua, be strong. There are three times that God says, he says to Zerubbabel, to Joshua, then to the people. Three times be strong. He, Moses instructed Joshua when he took the reins from Moses to be strong on three occasions. God spoke to Joshua three times and he said be strong. And when David commissioned Solomon to build the temple on three occasions, he said to Solomon, be strong. Amen? Because there's going to come difficult days. It's not going to be easy. It does take a lot of effort. But you can do this thing. Hallelujah. Church, it's time that we begin to wait on the Lord and renew our strength. It's time to get up and not stay down. Be strong in the Lord. And work. Oh, isn't this just going to happen? God's going to build his church. Does that mean that we don't do anything? Think again. You better understand it's going to take an applied effort to get this thing done. Once you get energized emotionally, then you can start working physically. You can't do anything physically if you're emotionally not ready. How many understand what I'm saying? If you're not motivated mentally, you're not going to work physically. Have you ever had one of those days where you just didn't feel like doing anything and you had to go to work? It was not a prosperous day, was it? Who could care less? I couldn't care any less. But God says, be encouraged. Be strong. And when you get strong, start working. Church, we got work to do. Amen? We're not going to tell you there's no work to do. Yesterday at the men's breakfast, we started determining what we were going to do and how we were going to do it. We started to have a plan and an agenda, not only work that was laborious, but work that would be beneficial and encouraging and relaxing because the work of the Lord also includes a few breaks along. you got to have a 15-minute break every four hours, right? So we'll give you a break in there. Hallelujah. But we have work to do. Amen? We have a job to do. So we're going to be calling on you to get involved. Because God said better days are ahead. Amen. Better days but it's going to take you and me to do our job. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, we are laborers together with God. Amen? We are laborers together. Don't let everybody else do all the work. Amen? Be strong and work. How, how many remember Nehemiah and the wall that had been destroyed? Remember the glory days of Jerusalem in his day? And all of a sudden now the walls are down, the cities in shambles, the people are discouraged. It's a, it's, a, it's a down and out time for Nehemiah. But he rebuilt that wall in 52 days, rather time had the whole wall rebuilt. And as you begin to read Nehemiah, he had this crew of people working on this gate, this crew. There were ten gates that had to be rebuilt, plus several towers along the way, plus the wall itself. This was not a small undertaking either. And I want you to know what he had. He had different groups of people doing different things. We need people involved in every area of ministry. We need to rebuild every area of ministry that we have. Amen? We need to shore it up. And when they went to work on the wall, they worked with a hammer in one hand and a weapon in the other. They had opposition during that time. And you're going to have opposition when you go through the recovery process. But we're still going to get it done, church. Hallelujah. Amen. It's still going to 
going to happen, but we have got to do our part. We can't sit back and let Sam Bell and Tobias shut us down. There will be people that run their mouth saying it will never happen, it won't work. I'm going to tell you it will because God said it. And that settles it. Hallelujah. He said, be strong and work. Why? For I am with you. Who Hebrews 13, 5 says, I will never leave you. And I'll never forsake you. I'm with you always unto the end of the earth. Amen. Hallelujah. In the, in the book of Genesis chapter 28, and verse number 15, Behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all thy places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Over in Deuteronomy chapter number 20 and verse number 1, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots, and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Hallelujah. It was a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. And Moses said, if your presence doesn't go, I'm not going. But I want you to know God is with us, church. Amen. That's why we are laborers together with him. He doesn't walk away when others do. He's saying to a church that's been demoralized. He's saying to a, a people that have been devastated. A people that have watched the glory of Solomon's temple destroyed by the Babylonians. He's saying, get ready to get strong. Get your attitude ready. Get your heart right. Then start doing something about it. Work. And when you get working, understand I'm with you. I haven't abandoned you. Ichabod has not been written. Some people, when they leave churches, they get mad at the pastor or the other people. And they'll say, when I leave, Ichabod's going to be written over the door of this church. Grow up, Jack. You're not that impressive or important to pronounce Ichabod on anything. God said, I will never leave. I'll never forsake you. And you know what? He'll walk with you even when you're not walking with Him. He'll be available for you to join hands again. He's not going to throw you away when you're down and out. The news is, church, God's in the house. Tell your neighbor, good days are ahead because God is in the house. God is in the house. Now we get down to where I really want to preach from. Now this is what I really want to talk about for a little bit. Verse 9. Joshua. No, 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 I better get back to Haggai. We're still in Deuteronomy. Verse 9 of chapter 2. The glory of this latter house shall be greater. Everybody say greater. greater. Than that of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of the latter will be greater than the glory of the former. It doesn't say the gold of the latter. It says the glory. The glory doesn't speak of the outward appearance. doesn't speak of the size of the congregation or the amount of money brought in in the offering. It's not talking about what people look at and call success. It's talking about the presence of Christ. That's the glory. Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. And he said, the glory of the latter will be greater than the glory of the former. The natural splendor, the visible, tangible grandeur of the first temple far exceeded that of the second temple. Zerubbabel's temple never matched in comparison with the, with the phenomenal beauty of Solomon's temple. What then does it mean that the glory of the, la of the latter will be greater than the glory of the former? You see, when Solomon's temple was dedicated, listen to me, the Shekinah glory of God was so thick the presence of God came down and it, the cloud of his presence filled that temple meeting place so that the priests 
could not even stand to minister. There was a visible, tangible expression of the glory of God in such a way that man couldn't even stand up. Sounds incredible, doesn't it? Phenomenal. Hard to beat. What can be more glorious than the cloud of God's presence filling the house of the Lord? We see the promise given to the latter temple was concerning Jesus actually in bodily form ministering in the new temple. Jesus never walked into Solomon's temple, but he walked into Zerubbabel's temple. And let me tell you, the cloud is one thing, but Christ is another. Amen. Amen. Did you hear what I just said? Yes. You can have a sign or you can have the source. You can have a type, or you can have the authentic, real deal. You see, the glory that eclipsed the former was the fact that Jesus himself stepped inside that meeting house. Amen? The glory we look for here is God incarnate, God in the flesh, the very presence of God filling the sanctuary. The cloud was in Incredible, but Christ himself was incomparable. Let me say that again. The cloud was incredible, but Christ was incomparable or incomparable. The glory of Jesus actually walking into the house superseded the cloud coming down and covering the people. Well, I think about the cloud, I get excited when I start thinking about Jesus. That's off the charts, friend. That is just off the charts. I feel Jesus. I feel Jesus. I feel Jesus in this place. Yes, my soul does burn within me. I Beautiful the first temple was. 
the glory of the second is greater because Jesus is there. Jesus is there. This temple, this church is built on the premise that Christ is here. And when people walk through the doors of this assembly, they need to be introduced to Jesus and meet Christ, not meet man. They need more than a cloud. They need Christ. They need more than a symbol. They need the source. We need Jesus in the house. I want to turn our attention to a third temple this morning. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own? You look at your life and you see the triumphs, and you see the tragedies. You see the success, and you see the failure. You see the ups, and you see the downs. But I want to tell you, if Solomon's temple said, I've had better days, and Zerubbabel's temple said, better days are coming, then your temple says the best is yet to come. Amen? Amen. The best is yet to come. You see, the most costly edifice ever erected was not framed by human hands. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 1 says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. You see, it was fashioned from clay by the master potter, and the price to purchase and possess this temple was of much greater value than in the earthly temple, even $140 billion spent on Solomon's. You see, the payment for this temple, not made with hands, was the blood of Christ. Priceless. The life of Jesus and the glory of this temple supersedes the glory of Solomon's temple and Zerubbabel's temple combined. Because it's in this temple that the Holy Ghost takes up residence. More glorious than a cloud for a day or Christ for a few years is the presence of the Holy Ghost continually. Constantly. You see, Solomon's temple had a day of glory. Zerubbabel had a number of years of Christ. But your temple has a continuance of the Holy Spirit in you. As we begin a rebuilding process in Central Assembly, God will guarantee a restoration. But it's time to be encouraged that although it will take work on our part, it's ultimately God's work.